Ladies and gentlemen, we are so excited to have a real, true, super cool professional here. I'm really honored to speak with you today. We have David Spinka, LCSW, a clinical therapist, who, as we were speaking, I learned so many fascinating parts about you that you do as a therapist. Um, actually, one of the most talked about topics of mental health is panic and anxiety. And today, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. The title for our podcast today is Navigating Anxiety and Panic with Resilience. We're going to be talking about how to figure out a way to overcome the challenges that a person experiences. So I know this is one of your specialties. Tell me a little bit about that. What made you want to focus on anxiety and panic? Well, first of all, Avi, thank you for having me here on this podcast. Definitely looking forward to getting into some of the deeper issues here. Um, The honest truth is, is that I have experienced anxiety myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I spent years worrying about what other people were going to think of me in terms of my professional career. Mm -hmm. Um, I struggled to make decisions when it came to dating specifically. It took me about uh, nine and a half years to settle down and find uh, my wife. I didn't date her for nine and a half years. (laughs) But um, and uh, I experienced a lot of anxiety along the way with career decisions, dating decisions. Um, I wanted to get some handle on it myself. Um, I experienced my own therapy. I went to graduate school at NYU uh, for my clinical social work degree um, and uh, eventually started working in different clinical settings before I started specializing in anxiety. And I worked at a place called the Center for Anxiety. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why it's called for anxiety as opposed to against it is important. (laughs) We'll talk about that as well today. Um, But then I started developing uh, an expertise and specialty in helping adults get over specific phobias and fears. Hmm. People who are worried about uh, driving on uh, the highway, going on trains, on planes, specific health anxiety, uh, dating decision anxiety, social anxiety, performance anxiety. And the word anxiety just seemed to come up again and again with my clients. I thought, hmm, this seems to be something that I can delve into a little bit. As we spoke, you know, we, I, I just, I was so fascinated with the type of work that you do. Is it okay if I share now? Sure. So we have to discuss this because I understand that you actually go on planes with some of your clients who are afraid of flying. Indeed. indeed. Tell me about that. So let me take a couple of steps back here. Um, The form of therapy that I use when it comes to phobias and fears is what we call exposure therapy, Uh learning how to gradually face our fears. Um, The way to conquer them, the way out is actually through them. Mm. But it has to be in a controlled, specific environment with a specific formula. Mm -hmm. So most of my clients who are coming to me have said, I've read books, I've listened to podcasts, but I never actually was able to get out and actually start doing it. Mm. So I actually walk them through every step of the way. Wow. Um, we don't get on quite plane literally day one, but literally. Yeah. Um, and I went to a client uh, on, a, on a plane with a client to DC and back. I've been on trains with clients. We've been on uh, elevators, uh, heights, yeah. uh, doctor's office, you name it. But yeah, absolutely, yeah, getting on planes and uh, facing off is and learning how to do it in a specific way that will help us first understand and then eventually conquer off is. Uh, to get that freedom back, which is really what we all want to get, is that independence and freedom that anxiety is often taken away from people. For sure. And also as as someone who sees clients in the office struggling so much with the anxiety and making people feel like they don't have control over their life, for example, not being able to fly or not being able to go on an elevator and how that can mess up their daily life and you have the ability to actually get them through that, I can imagine as a therapist, that's so rewarding for you. Absolutely. It's, it's one of the most rewarding aspects when I get an email uh, you know, years later from a client saying, here, here I am in the, in the middle of nowhere, flying somewhere or going on a, on a plane or a train, uh, driving, doing the things that I've always wanted to be doing, but yeah. that my world used to be really small mm-hmm. because of my anxiety, and now it's big again. And that's yeah. really the goal, the goal of therapy for me is to get people uh, out of my office and back out into the world. And doing the things that they always want to be doing. Yeah. And the interesting part is, is that you work primarily with adults, but also with professionals. And here's the interesting part. Oftentimes I find that people have this negative labeling to what therapy is. And this idea that if I'm in therapy, then something's wrong with me or I'm broken and um, I need to be fixed almost. Right. But you actually work with pretty successful people. Absolutely. I would say almost exclusively my clients are high functioning professionals, um, everyday people who have specific areas that they are struggling with. And most people have kept them secret for years. Mm. 
And because they're so high functioning, um, they're able to cope. You know, I have a client, she, she mentioned that uh, um, if she goes on vacation, she'll always get the ground floor um, mm. room because she doesn't want to take the elevators. Nobody would know it. That's how she accommodates. Or if somebody mm. has a fear of taking the subway, they'll just walk or take the cab. Mm -hmm. um, if they have to fly somewhere, maybe they'll drive. But absolutely, it's everyday people who are struggling with small, big, medium, little things um, and just normalizing it. You wow. know, if you have a physical ailment, you go to a doctor, you can have a coach, you can have a therapist, you can have somebody help you understand your anxiety and guide you through it. Um, and everyday people are struggling. And I will say that COVID actually was very helpful for this. Mm. Um, I noticed that people kind of just allowed the mask to be removed. Uh, everybody was struggling in COVID to some extent. And it allowed a lot of people to just say, you know, what? it's OK for me to get help. It's OK mm. for me to start afresh and to you know, start to understand myself a little bit better and get practical skills and tools to manage my anxiety and start to, to thrive again. For sure. And one of the things that I notice is that oftentimes people confuse panic and anxiety. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, definitely. A lot of terms are, are, are confused. Maybe I can take a step back and talk about fear. Sure. Um, so fear is a very healthy emotion. Fear protects us from danger. Um, if there's a car and you're running in the street, you feel a, a sense of adrenaline, fear, there's danger, uh, it helps protect you. Mm -hmm. um, the core of anxiety is about some kind of a fear or worry about the future, a future event. It could be about event in five minutes, if I'm giving a talk or presentation. It could be a pervasive general worry about everything, health, anxiety, relationships, um, and it could be centered around something specific. But the anxiety is more this, uh, is the key feature really is their worry. Worry about uncertainty, the what if of the future. Mm -hmm. um, and it's primarily, primarily about rumination in your head, intrusive thoughts. You have trouble sleeping too. There can be other aspects too, but it's really worry is the predominant feature. Whereas when it comes to panic, panic is really primarily about the physical symptoms that manifest in the body. And if I can, I just want to mention a few of the common symptoms of panic and specifically a panic attack. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, when they feel a rush of adrenaline, what will happen is the heart will start pounding faster. Uh, they'll feel sweaty or hot. Uh, most people feel some kind of muscle tension somewhere. Personally, I feel it in my head over here. Mm -hmm. uh, or my chest will start to tighten. Uh, people feel it in their neck, um, often or their shoulders. Some people feel nauseous in their stomach, mm -hmm. uh, something in their pit. A lot of people also will feel a little bit what we call derealization or depersonalization out of it. Detached from their body, detached from the world a little bit. All of these can be very common physical symptoms. And the key with panic is that these symptoms are intense and they're actually brief. Uh, we'll talk a little bit you know, later on a little about how brief and how intense they can get. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's primarily about those physical symptoms that people worry about, as opposed to this uh, general worry that's uh, primarily about thoughts and can have other effects too. And the anxiety is more? And, and anxiety is more about the general worry. Mm. Uh, it absolutely can have physical symptoms, especially muscle tension, you know, restlessness, difficulty with sleeping. But it's more about, uh, like I said, the rumination, the worry, the yeah. thinking, and the behaviors too, whereas panic is more specifically about that physical symptoms and the, the rush of adrenaline and, and the physical symptoms that we yeah. mentioned before. So I know you spoke a little bit about fear. And where would you say is the beginning, the birthplace of anxiety and panic? When does that usually start in development? Uh -huh, great question. The million dollar question. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to say is that everybody is different. right? The, the nature-nurture debate, uh, I think, is over. Mm. Both are clearly true. Um, I remember I was, I was coming late to work with a, with a colleague on, on the train. And uh, our clients were clearly waiting for us in the office and the, the train had stopped. And he's sitting there completely calm. And, you know, I'm an anxiety therapist. Here. I do all this stuff all the time. But I'm feeling antsy and here I am. I'm the therapist and they're waiting for me and they're late. So I have skills and tools to manage my anxiety. But naturally, he's just a calmer person. Mm -hmm. Some people naturally just have a different makeup. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's a nature to it. There's a nurture to it. How we grew up, how our parents are, um, how we view and process Physical stress, which we'll talk about, and our, and our anxiety has a huge impact over here. And in terms of where it starts, people can have a, a predisposition towards uh, anxiety, and there can be certain life events that can trigger them. Uh, mm -hmm. A move, uh, end of a relationship, beginning of one, a uh, particularly stressful school year, stress can absolutely impact uh, that as well. But the short answer is that people are different, mm -hmm. and that uh, it can start at any time for, for anyone. Uh, and we'll talk also about how everyone experiences anxiety, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's, that's the short of it. No matter what you do, how much money you make, where you live, what degrees you have, I agree with you that anxiety, yeah. everyone experiences. Everyone has a moment in their life where they feel either they need some more support or they have to become mindful and see like what's going on. 
Let me kind of speak to my inner child to see what's happening there that I need to work on. Even just being able to kind of gather your thoughts. A lot of the times when a person feels panic, they want to fight or flight, even with anxiety. Being able to fix the situation, but also escape. Because a lot of the times our brain doesn't like the feeling of being uncomfortable. What are your thoughts about that? Yes. Yeah. The hitting, fight or flight response. Hitting the nail on the head. That, that, the fight or flight response is there to protect us when mm -hmm. there is real danger. Um, we want the fight or flight. We want the panic to be there if we actually have to run away from something. Mm -hmm. uh, and if our anxiety is communicating there is something dangerous or a person is dangerous or a situation, then absolutely we want to listen to that. Uh, but so often um, our alarm, that alarm system, goes off when there isn't really anything wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, if, uh, if the toast is burning and the alarm goes off in the house, it's doing its job but it's not really actual danger there. Mm -hmm. um, and our brain often can't differentiate. And so, so often it feels that certain situations are really dangerous when in fact they're not. They can be very uncomfortable at times. Um, and we'll talk also a lot about that, about what situations are uh, appropriate to feel anxiety. And yeah. uh, the key feature, if I may just in, interrupt over here, what, what differentiates anxiety that everybody commonly experiences from something that's actually a problem, mm. from something that's uh, perhaps a disorder, or something yep. that you, maybe you should seek help for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always about the frequency intensity, and duration. And as an overall theme, how much it affects your everyday life. Mm -hmm. So if you have a particular event, you have a speaking event, and you're nervous before it, and you're preparing, and you feel anxiety, and then you give it, it goes, and you're fine, great. But if you are days and weeks beforehand uh, have what we call anticipatory anxiety, you can't sleep at night, you're ruminating, you're worrying about yep. it, it persists, um, and it's extremely intense, and it's affecting your day-to-day -day life, that's when we want to start uh, start to think about, okay, this can be something I really need to address. Mm -hmm. Okay, so normal anxiety comes up for everybody. Yeah. Um, but what happens when the stressor is gone and how often, how intense mm -hmm. is it? So for someone who's listening now and might be either having to prepare for a speech or a podcast, a, a, <laughs> a podcast or have a job interview or even uh, thinking about walking down the aisle, getting married or even thinking about dating and they feel that anxiety building up. What are some words of possibly either encouragement that you can share with them or even some tools you can give them to be able to normalize what they're experiencing? So the first thing to do is to do exactly that, normalize it. Mm. Uh, you're okay. Your body is working. Um, why people experience certain uh, anxiety around certain issues and others not, that's definitely individualized. But the first thing to know is it's okay. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, when I say nothing wrong with you, I mean, we, there are things we want to address, but it's normal to feel this way. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing we want to do is to notice what's happening in our body. That's the first thing I always, I always tune into. Uh, take a pause. Uh, just talking about that, that incident on, going on, to, to, on the train with, with that colleague. The first thing I did was take a step back, identify what's, what, what my body is feeling right now. Oh, tightness in my chest. I'm heavy breathing. Um, take a step back and just try to see what your body is actually feeling and just tell yourself, okay, it's okay. When I say it's okay, it doesn't mean I'm going to be okay. It just means it's okay that I'm feeling these physical symptoms. Mm -hmm. They're not dangerous. They're uncomfortable. Um, and getting support is going to be really important, which we'll talk about. Yeah. And that doesn't always have to be with a therapist, but absolutely getting some support, normalizing it, taking that first step back and just being like, oh, it's okay. What do you mean by it doesn't always have to be with a therapist? So some people uh, can uh, listen to a podcast, read a good book, mm -hmm. um, you know, watch a YouTube series about understanding anxiety, um, and other people can actually make lifestyle changes. Mm. Um, you know, I saw a study recently that shows that 40% of your mood is determined by how much you have slept. Wow. So 40% is a lot. That's mm -hmm. very significant. So for some people, they have uh, a lot of things going on in their life. They're not sleeping well. Sleep, exercise, and nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. Those are three foundational pillars that can have a huge impact on our mood. Sure. And depending on the issue that you're dealing with, that itself might be enough. Uh, for some people, it may just be talking to a friend that is normalizing, oh, I've got this speech coming up or I have this social event I'm really scared about. And you hear them saying, yeah, I'm exactly the same way. It's really tough or you've got this, it's okay. For some people, that may be enough to help them normalize what they're feeling, um, ride the emotional waves of their physical discomfort uh, and just go about their lives. And for some people, that's enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but for other people it's much more chronic or more intense than that. And um, they worry about things for nights and they're not sleeping um, and they have a tremendous amount of fear and they have a tremendous amount of shame. Um, that can be helpful, of course, to, uh, to reach out to a mental health professional. Although I will also just point out, you don't actually have to wait for that to reach out to somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, you could be in that first camp 
that I spoke about and still want to have somebody to talk to, to talk mm -hmm. it through with, to strategize, to understand, yeah. to normalize, to validate. Um, but if there's one thing you take away from, from this podcast is it's okay that things aren't okay. Yeah. And there are people out there that can help um, and very quickly too. So if you were to get a call from a client that says, um, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with dating and getting out there in the dating scene, what do I do? You set up a session, they come in for a session. What's a usual technique or modality you would use that you find works best with treating anxiety or panic? Okay. So first I want to get a little bit of a history. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't mean what your parents were like and uh, the last 50 years. I mean history of your, your dating history. Mm. Um, and I just want to understand a little bit of what are the key themes that keep coming up again and again. Mm -hmm. What specific aspects of the dating process do you find scary? For mm -hmm. some people, it's the not even the going out. It's the decision making afterwards. Mm -hmm. Do I like him? Do I like her? Um, is this the person for me? How do I know for sure? Yeah. For other people, it's the date itself. How do I make small talk? Uh, how do I know how much to open up or be vulnerable about? So the first thing I want to do is to identify what are your specific fears and anxieties around the dating process. Uh, we want to normalize them. Um, and after we've identified them, we'll start to tackle them one by one. Mm -hmm. um, so for people who are you know, having a hard time with making a decision, I'll encourage them to delay making that decision, mm -hmm. to go out for a few dates without actually having to make a decision. Uh, you know, if I'm having a conversation with you and I say, you know, Avi, how's this conversation going right now? So, well, we're just having it. Give me a bit of time, right? So let's take that pressure off having to make a decision. Let's go out for a few dates. Let's see what happens. And then we can, we can make, it, make a decision about that. If we're having anxiety about the social aspect to it, making light conversation, when to get deeper, how to get deeper, we'll break it down and we'll role play together. Mm -hmm. um, we'll definitely have relaxation techniques and self-care techniques and lifestyle um, behaviors I think are going to be important as a foundation, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll take a different uh, approach depending on the situation. But the, the short of it is let's identify the specifics of your anxiety. Let's tackle them one by one. And let's also make some lifestyle changes to, to mitigate some of those anxieties. Very well said. It sounds like also it's about making a plan. When a person, when we make a plan and when we help our clients create a system and allow a space for them to talk about the fears that may come up, it decreases some of that anxiety because anxiety is the fear of unknown. What will happen? And when a lot of the times our brain creates a story that's not there, right? So mm -hmm. in a situation like that, we can talk about a plan. However, one of the things that you mentioned is, how do I know if this person is for me? That's a huge life decision because as we know, we can date a person for a long period of time and everything seems okay and then we marry the person and then unfortunately there's so many people who got married and then eventually got divorced right yeah. they didn't get married to get divorced but then they say you know this person wasn't for me and oftentimes they find that people are afraid to make that decision which takes me to another topic which is risks and i know before we started this podcast i said you know you go into a car with a patient, with a client who is afraid to drive on the highway and, and you do it with them to help them overcome their exposure for that first session. And you said, you know, you do it to help them and you know that there's some risk involved there because your safety is not 100% guaranteed. Yeah. In our life, risks mm. is a price to pay to be able to live a full, incredible, amazing life. So share a little bit about taking risks, especially when dealing with anxiety and having to make a choice. These are such good points, Avi. I'm very excited to share some of these, these issues here. Uh, anxiety is about the fear of the unknown. Life is unknown. Um, people worry about taking risks. We are taking risks all the time. Mm -hmm. I remember in my previous job, I, um, there was a book in the office called The Book of Risk. Mm. They spoke about 200,000 different things that could go wrong. Wow. One of them was like a global pandemic at any moment um, or apple juice poisoning. We take risks all the time. There's this element that we feel that if only I could get control or certainty, right? We want to get certainty and control in our lives. Um, but very little is in our control. So I want to first open people's eyes up to this concept that we actually don't have control over most things in life. Mm. Um, you know, uh, you go to bed at night with the person next to you, you have no idea what they're going to do with you in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. If I'm with a client in the office, I'll tell them, where is your wallet right now? And they say, what's in my pocket? And they say, well, how confident are you that it's there? I said, well, I checked it before the session. I said, I'm sure you've seen, you know, YouTube clips of people, you know, uh, distracting you and then taking your wallet. And 
You're not hundred percent sure. You think you are, um, but there's risk everywhere. Um, there's a balance between risk, engaging, living. Uh, some some of my, some of my clients will tell me I'd prefer to just stay in my house all day where there's no risk. Mm. Really, there's no risk. I mean, houses could collapse, uh, fires could happen. There's risk everywhere. Mm -hmm. And at first, this can be really scary. You know, most of my clients, it's very interesting. They come in with a specific issue. They may have one or two things they worry about, but there's 90 other things they don't worry about that other clients are absolutely petrified about. And I'll tell them, why, why are you okay with getting in the elevator, but you're not okay with uh, you know, driving or whatever it is? What is it about this specific issue? And they say, you know what, you're right. Maybe I should worry about that other thing, but they don't. Mm -hmm. Because most people with 95% of areas in their life are perfectly okay with embracing uncertainty and lack of control. We just don't think about it. We live. You go out to a restaurant, you're not worried about getting food poisoning. Uh, or if you are, you walk past the buildings in Manhattan and you're not worried about them collapsing like one of my clients is and won't walk anywhere near any building really. Mm -hmm. um, so risk is around us all the time. What happens is that we take one or two key areas and we have a very hard time tolerating risk. Mm. And what I encourage people to do is to take a, a step back and see the areas that they're embracing risk in mm -hmm. and try to translate that into these areas too. Because life is always about risk. Yeah. Going back to your question of how do you know this is the right person? The truth is you actually don't. Wow. You'll never know for sure. And I'm sure you'll hear people will say, I just knew the moment I met my wife, the moment I met my husband, this was just right. You don't know for sure. It's more about their emotional makeup that gives them a certain feeling, but they don't have 100% clarity. Um, people will change. Everyone will change at some times. You will change. Um, hopefully it's enough within the parameters that you have a good enough relationship and you can learn skills and tools to communicate uh, so that you have a thriving relationship. But the short answer is you won't know for sure. The goal is going to be give us to give us enough uh, information to get a certain sense of comfort that I'm going to be able to go on a journey with this person mm. with risk, like with everything in life, uh, but enough of a base that I feel conf confident and comfortable. Mm -hmm. And those words confident, confident and comfortable are much more important than clarity or certainty. Mm -hmm. Because some people, it's just in their nature. You know, if I go and buy a suit, that's just part of my nature. I know I'm not going to be 100% comfortable until I come back home and I can't exchange it. That's mm -hmm. just my nature. Uh, other people will go, they'll choose a suit and they'll be totally fine, they'll come back. Uh, so it's about getting more comfortable and confident rather than 100% certain, mm -hmm. which we can't have. And the more you do it, the more resilient you become. Absolutely, absolutely. So just as a small example with shopping for, you know, that I maybe have a harder time with, uh, the better uh, I get at it, the more I practice it, the easier it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and you understand, oh, just because I'm having this feeling of doubt doesn't actually necessarily mean that there's something wrong here. It may be, and that's something we we'll want to look at together in, in therapy, you know, what are the specifics either of your general pattern in dating or the specific relationship? And sometime, sometimes your emotions are communicating something really important that you want to listen to. Mm -hmm. But it's just that. It's something to listen to, to talk about, to, to look in in terms of the whole context of things. Yeah. Um, but not in terms of certainty uh, or 100% guarantees. And it seems like practicing is key. Just because you did it one time, it's not good enough. You have to keep doing it to allow your body to become comfortable with this new change that's happening. I usually say to my clients, two things are happening. You're breaking a habit and you're making a new habit with whatever that may be, whether it's driving on the highway, going to a tall building, getting on an airplane, holding a tarantula in your hand, doing different types of things and allowing your body to experience this change. One of the most common, it's almost like a buzzword now we hear is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. So tell me about cognitive behavioral therapy and if you use that and how you use that to treat specifically anxiety or and panic and also the concept of people can change. This idea of, well, I've been doing this all my life. I've been afraid of, let's say, dogs all my life. This is just how I operate or I've been afraid to go into elevators all my life. How are you going to change that for me? So almost like rewiring the brain. What's your technique with that? Yeah. Uh, really important points here. So the belief in change is paramount, especially for cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, my personal take is that understanding the past can be deeply healing, but not always necessary for change. And cognitive behavioral therapy very much focuses on the present and the future. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not addressing here specific traumas, which I think have to be dealt with uh, in a different format. Um, I'm talking specifically about these, these phobias. We don't actually have to understand exactly how they developed or why they developed. We just need to understand what is happening. And in cognitive behavioral therapy, it focuses on really a three-pronged approach. Cognitive is your thoughts, the things that we're telling ourselves about uh, a specific thing, normally catastrophizing, uh, overgeneralizing, and worrying about things. 
there's the um, behavior, what I do, and most people avoid. Mm. Uh, that's a key key theme of of what happens, and we'll we'll talk about that too. Um, and there's also this this concept of physically what's happening in my body at the time. So in cognitive behavioral therapy, you understand the relationship between my thoughts, my feelings, what's happening in my body, my emotions, and my actions. So let's say, for example, I'm, uh, I don't like the subway. So every time I'm walking to work and I see the subway station and I just see it and instinctively just move away, behavior, I avoid. Then I start thinking, oh, what's wrong with me? Uh, I'm such an idiot. Why can't I just get on the subway? And then I notice I'm, my chest is starting to tighten. I'm starting, my breathing is getting a little bit heavy. Um, and you can see that interaction instantly. And you can start from different points. For some people, they're waking up in the morning, they're thinking, oh my gosh, I really should go on the subway, but I don't want to do that. Um, and then they start to feel those physical sensations again, and then they decide to, to say, you know what, I'm going to sleep in today. And that, it mm-hmm. starts there. Uh, so you can start at different, different places. But the point is, is that cognitive behavioral therapy understands there's a relationship between my thoughts, my feelings, and my behaviors. And in CBT for short, what we do is we tackle them individually. And you can start from different places. You can start with behavior. And for some people, that's enough. I actually don't have to understand my thoughts or what's happening physically at the, at the moment. For some people, with the right support, with the right therapist, gently uh, facing their fears can be enough. Mm-hmm. And for other people, we want to understand my thinking process. What are the things I'm saying to myself that are sabotaging um, and are uh, catastrophizing? And we also want to get more comfortable with our physical sensations, understanding them, learning that physical sensations are not dangerous. They can be extremely uncomfortable, but not dangerous. Mm-hmm. So the approach here is going to be face, not avoid. Yeah. And uh, it's very much present focused and uh, it's gradual and very much built upon the belief that people can change and very quickly. Most of my clients, when they're talking about specific fears or phobias like driving or uh, planes or anything like that, four to six weeks is a typical uh, course for therapy. Yeah. If it's a longer term things or health anxiety, other things that can take a little bit longer sometimes, um, but it's very much predicated on the belief that people are able to change and having an action plan mm-hmm. and a supportive therapist is going to be key. Yeah. One of the most talked about topics is also procrastinating. Mm-hmm. Tell me how procrastinating falls into the category of actually possibly anxiety and panic. Oftentimes people push it away thinking that, oh, it's just something that they don't want to do. But in reality, it's a stress response. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Can I ask you? Uh, sure. Tell me about the last thing that you procrastinated with, and it has hmm. to be for at least more than a day, not just like a one. More time, than a day. Yeah, not one time that I pushed off for a few hours, but something consistently okay. that oh, I know I wanted to get. To okay, this. here you go. You ready? I'm going to yeah. be like super vulnerable. Let me get comfortable in my chair. Are you yeah, ready? I'm ready. I was actually procrastinating for a while doing this podcast, okay. not specific, not with you, but just in general, starting a podcast. That was really, that was actually, I was putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And I, I didn't understand why. And I remember having this conversation with my wife. I said, something just doesn't make sense. All, I got all my ducks in a row. I got the studio. I got the editors. We have everything ready to go. But what's, why am I just not doing it? What's holding me back? And it was actually the fear of failure. Yeah. Not doing well enough. Not having people to listen to it. Um, and w- will it be successful? And that's what was holding me back. But part of one of my, you know, getting into my therapy toolbox and I'm like, okay, what's avoiding, you know, what am I avoiding there? And also speaking with a therapist and just like ripping off the bandaid and saying, you know what, if I mess up, okay, this is part of my journey and it's part of my growth too. Absolutely. So it's not if you mess up, at some point everyone will mess yeah. up in some way. Mm-hmm. That's a really beautiful example. Thank you for sharing that. Because that's exactly that. Look, look at the situation. Here I am. I'm avoiding uh, starting this podcast, even though I have everything set up. So if you think about it, there's the avoidance, there's the behavior, there's the thoughts, the fears, the emotions, um, the what if, what if I fail? So first of all, just having something to talk to in of itself may have been helpful. Mm-hmm. But then once you start to hear those voices, I always tell people, if your emotion could talk, what would it say? Mm. So that fear is saying, oh, if I start this, I may fail. Okay. Now we can listen to it with a little bit of compassion, not with, not with judgment, just, un- okay, I may fail. That's possible. And what helped you get over that? What helped me get over it? Understanding that in order to succeed in anything that I do, I would have to allow myself to also fail. Yeah. And that would eventually be part of my growth and part of my story. 
Um, just looking back at my life and the type of practice I've built, I, for those that you know know a little bit about my the type of work that I do, I live with so many different types of animals. I own a horse. I live with the horse. The horse lives in my house. That was really scary for me to do as well. You know, I don't have any. I, I didn't have any experience living with a horse and you know all these different types of animals. And to be honest, that was scary for me. What am I getting into? Am I making a huge mistake? Is my life going to change significantly that I won't enjoy it anymore? Am I going to eventually want to give it away and then grow attached to it? So many scary different thoughts. And I did a lot of research. And at the end point, I said, you know what? Based on the research, based on the things that I've read and the people I spoke with, it seemed like a great thing to do. I'll do it. And if for some reason it doesn't work out like I expected, I'll evaluate it at that point. And I did it. And I never looked back. It was the best thing I've ever did. That's awesome. Um, That's awesome. So you see, Avi, that behind that procrastination was fear, was the emotion. So you asked me, what is behind procrastination? There's usually some emotion there. Mm -hmm. And we want to identify that. Talk it out. You know, you hear these cliches all the time, facing your fears, allowing yourself to to fail. Those are for other people. Mm. That's what we think. But it's about us. Everybody has it. That's that's how growth happens. You have to fail, right? If you go to the gym, if you want to grow muscles, you have to have muscle failure. Mm -hmm. Um, That's part of growth. So what you did there was you identified, okay, why am I procrastinating? If I'm taking away the judgment, I'm just shining a flashlight on this and I'm seeing what's here. There's fear there. What are those thoughts saying? Then when I can listen to them without judging, just noticing them, then I can start to say, okay, maybe I can take a risk. Mm. What if? Um, and that's what I'll do a lot with my clients. When we talk about anxieties and fears, I'll ask people, what if it does happen? What if the worst case scenario does happen? And then when we actually start to think about that, we see that maybe that's not so bad after all. Mm-hmm. And if it is, maybe I can pivot to something else. Yeah. Um, but that's often what's behind it. There's usually emotions behind procrastination, and we want to identify them, shine the flashlight on them, let them talk, let us feel them, and then see how we can start to tackle them behaviorally one by one. How do you think, by the way, be- beautifully said, that was really, really very well thought out. In all of this, where do you find overthinking playing a role? <laughs> where does it not? Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, I think it also depends on your personality, but that's a lot where perfectionism comes into play. Mm. Um, this belief that I have to be perfect all the time, I have to make the right decision at the right time all the time. Um, you know, imagine somebody who's sitting there, you know, and he's working really hard and he's thinking, should I go out to have a break now and get something to eat or drink? Should I, shouldn't I, I haven't been working long enough. At some point, whether it's the right or wrong decision doesn't matter. You're taking, taking yourself away from the thing that's important to you. Uh, just go and have the drink or go, go and yeah. go and eat. Um, so once I've actually lost my train of thought, what was your question again? So r- being able to tell a person that whenever they're dealing with so much that's going on in their life mm-hmm. and they want to be able to stop that overthinking in their mind, what do they do in that situation? How do they overcome their overthinking? Yeah, the overthinking, that noise, lowering the voice in their head, that bully that's living in their head and making them overthink. What can they say to themselves to kind of lower the volume and do whatever they have to do and just get mindful and present about the task at hand? Okay. So that there are specific mindfulness skills I think are going to be important for people to learn. And the first is welcoming in the thoughts, mm-hmm. seeing them as something separate, separate from you. I mean, I ask this to clients all the time, you know, are you your thoughts? Mm. And people say, of course, I'm my thoughts. And I say, that's actually not true. You have thoughts. Your heart pumps blood around your body. And one of the functions of your brain is it pumps thoughts. Mm. Some of those thoughts you're going to use to make decisions. Mm-hmm. And some you're just going to let them be there. Yeah. So I have this a lot with people who have intrusive, unwanted thoughts. Let me ask you, what percentage of people do you think have intrusive, unwanted thoughts? What type of, What percentage What of percentage? People? Yeah. Honestly, yeah. I think everyone has intrusive thoughts. So a study showed 91% of people. Oh, okay, there you uh, go. That was close. The other 9% are lying. <laughs> I love that. Without doubt. <laughs> Everybody has them at times. Yeah. Uh, I remember I had a, a professor at NYU, uh, this sweet old lady. She said, you know, the other day I was uh, chopping vegetables in the kitchen and I had this thought, wow, I could stab somebody with this knife. Mm-hmm. And then she just carried on chopping and we were all sitting there in the class, you know, aghast, this sweet old lady. Whereas oh, I would have been horrified if I had that thought. We have this fear that of our thoughts. If mm. I have a thought, oh my gosh, I have to act on it. It's me. It's who I am. If they do something, other people will be driving down the highway and have the thought, I could just flip the car. Or what if I'm standing by the subway, I could just push somebody off. What's wrong with me? Why am I having these thoughts? This is terrible. I'm a terrible person. Mm. Um, or I'm having inappropriate thoughts or any kind of thoughts. The first thing I want people to do is to understand you are not your thoughts. You have thoughts. Wow. You can view your thoughts as you know objects going down a river, clouds in the sky. But once we've welcomed in the thoughts, seeing them as something separate from me, then we can start to say, okay, welcome. 
sit down, take a, take a seat in the room, let's let them talk for a little bit. Um, and then the goal won't be to push them away. Uh, right? Pushing never works, right? If, if you're stressed and somebody tells you, just relax, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. It has the opposite effect, aside from of being course. patronizing. Right. Uh, if you're stressed and you're trying to go to sleep and you tell yourself, just go to sleep, go to sleep. Never works. Never works. So we can't push our thoughts out. Right. Um, you know, if I told you, whatever you do, do not think about a water bottle uh, for this entire session. I just thought about a water bottle. Boom, right? I can't tell you not to. But what I can tell you is, okay, notice that it's there. You know, one of my clients, he's always looking at the clock in the, in the session, in our therapy sessions. Oh my gosh, I keep looking at the clock again. I tell them, okay, just notice you're looking at the clock and gently re-engage. You know, we're right now in, in these uh, swivel chairs here. Mm -hmm. How many times do you think I've readjusted them to keep my uh, uh, gaze straight at you? Interesting. I never paid attention. Many. Without any effort. Right. It's not yeah. this forceful rope pulling, stop right. thinking, stop. Just gentle, shifting, yeah. re-engaging. So the first step is welcoming the thoughts, identify them, let them talk freely, mm -hmm. um, and then gently refocus on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So sometimes those thoughts are telling you something important and we need to look at them and we need to uh, analy well, say analyze them because analysis often leads to paralysis, but at least just uh, identify certain themes of them. But yeah. very often in the daytime, we just need to allow them to be there and engage in what's, imp what's important for us. Mm -hmm. And if there are certain themes that keep coming up again and again, certain themes that I'm noticing I'm worrying about, uh, that could be a whole different thing, which I can talk about worry scripts if, you, if you'd like me to go down that path. Yeah. So but, um, as you're talking about this, you know, what comes up is social anxiety, being that we are creatures of, you know, we're, we're always so in social situations, whether it's at home with, with our family members or relatives, or if we go to a wedding, if we go to, um, you know, synagogue, if we, anywhere we go at work, we're always surrounded by people. And if we're not, that's a whole other story. If we're home by ourselves and don't really go outside, that's a, that's a whole other can of worms. But being that we have to be with people, life is just made that way. And oftentimes people struggle with social anxiety. Yeah. What can you share about that? Oh, social anxiety, where do we begin here? Um, such a common issue uh, in so many different fronts um, and so normal. Um, we all care about what other people think of us, everybody. And that's a normal, natural human thing. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the frequency, intensity, duration of it is, is going to be key. Um, but I wish people could know what other people are thinking. Mm. Um, I'll tell you a little anxiety equation over here. Uh, we overestimate the likelihood of people judging us. And on the flip side, we underestimate our ability to cope if they do. Wow, that's so So we powerful. overestimate the likelihood of people judging us and we mm -hmm. underestimate our ability to cope if they do. Uh, most people are not thinking about us. They barely notice anything. They're thinking about themselves. And it's called the spotlight effect. You know, we think the spotlight is on us and everybody's watching us. Mm -hmm. We think they can feel my heart pounding and uh, notice everything. Most people do not. But for a small percentage of people, they do. And learning how to tolerate judgments and criticism from other people is an important life skill. Mm -hmm. um, exposure therapy, if I may just like to a little segue over here, definitely relates to this. People have tremendous fear about what other people are thinking. And I actually want people to get comfortable tolerating judgments from other people. If people have fear that, oh my gosh, if I come two minutes late to a meeting, people are going to judge me and think X, Y, Z. If I send a typo in an email, uh, I'm going to quit my job and everybody's going to judge me for that. If I start a conversation and I stumble on my words, people are going to judge me. I want people to get practice in that. In fact, in, in, in my uh, therapy practice, I will have people go to Central Park and first ask people the time and then we'll eventually build up to something a little bit harder like, uh, where is Central Park? I'll have them ask people, where is Central Park while they're standing in Central Park? Wow. I can't do that. Everyone's going to think I'm an idiot. That's terrible. <laughs> I can't do that. Most of the time, people don't bat an eyelid. People don't judge you as much as they, you think they will. And one person did say, oh, what's wrong? You know, we're in Central Park. And I asked my client, you know, how was that? He said, it was tough, but it was, it was kind of freeing to be able mm. to tolerate that judgment. I'll have people go to a Starbucks to pay for a coffee with dimes um, and sit there and feel that gaze of other people on their, uh, um, you know, on their back. And we get to see so much that all the judgments that we're worrying about and the people are thinking, most of the time they're just not. And definitely not to the intensity you think they are. And that even more importantly, if they are, you learn how to tolerate those judgments. Anything that you do in life, anything, people may judge you. Um, and it's learning how to get comfortable with that so that you can focus on the things that are important to you and the people that you really care about and not just uh, being held back by fear all the time. I think I'm actually going to do that. The next time I go get Starbucks, I'm going to pay in dimes. <laughs> because as you said that, I just thought for a moment, at the end of that experience, it would feel so freeing. Yes, maybe a little bit unco in uncomfortable in the moment, yeah. but afterwards, if I'm able to do that, and just be in that space 
and allow myself to feel after that, you're like, hey, I did that. Yeah. I can kind of do anything now. And allow yourself to go from an uncomfortable situation over and over again. And I agree with you. We have so much potential. And a lot of the times we hold ourselves back because we all, we think that we're not capable of doing things that are, require some some courage. Absolutely. You know, we're so worried about failure. But uh, I think I heard Brene Brown say, what, what are some things that you would do even if you failed? Mm. Even if people do judge you, even if it doesn't work out. If you knew that you could just face those things, yeah, um, it's so freeing to do that. And um, yeah, when when you get comfortable understanding that people don't care as much as you think they do, and that you can tolerate their judgments and focus on what's important to you and live your life. You know, I, I mentioned a few exposures here that that we spoke about social ones, but ultimately, I want people to be doing the things that they want to be doing. Uh, so we'll practice the the mental muscle in some areas, but it's about the things you want to be doing. Do you want to be going out to a party? Do you want to be talking with friends? Do you want to be able to having conversations on a date? It's about what you want to be doing and we'll practice that and we'll break it down into small pieces that you get more and more comfortable seeing that people don't judge you, they don't really care. Right. And if they do, that's also okay. Do you notice that many of your clients after they experience a lot of this, they have an increased level of confidence and self-esteem and self-worth? Without doubt. You know, we title this uh, uh, with resilience. Yeah. That's what resilience means. Resilience means I have strength. I can bounce back. I can do things in other areas. I, I had a client who came in uh, she couldn't be in elevators, trains, planes, and what was the fourth thing? Uh, I'm forgetting now the fourth thing. But we only worked on elevators. That was it. She had tremendous panic and fear about being in elevators. Mm -hmm. And we worked on that for a few weeks. And after that, we went on the subway. And within a day, we, work, we worked on that. She said, wait, wait a second. We didn't have to do the whole process we just went through. And I said, no, mm -hmm. your mind is a muscle. Yep. Anytime you work on one aspect of you strengthen that muscle and you can use it in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, a, a client where we were doing some some driving exposures and now she, she's able to drive no problem. She can publicly speak now without actually actively working on it because it's the same formula. Yeah. The understanding what's happening in my mind, in my body and facing my fears. And it feels great. As you're speaking, it's so nice to sit with someone who just speaks my language and also gets to experience what I experience. Because for example, if I work with someone who says I'm I'm afraid of all animals. So I'll say, okay, let's let's do some exposure therapy with dogs. And they'll do the the whole exposure with dogs and they're no longer afraid with dogs. And I will say, okay, we're gonna now do exposure with a cat. Within that one session, they're able to pick up the cat, hold the cat, feed the cat, play with it, and do all of it. And they're like, this doesn't make sense. I've been working with, you know, four or five sessions with dogs and within one session I'm able to do it with a cat. And I agree with you. It's that muscle. People are able to build that muscle even if they've been carrying this, I don't know if you want to call it trauma, but this baggage with them for mm -hmm. such a long time. As I'm speaking, are you ready to do something exciting? All right. I'm, I'm absolutely not. When I came in <laughs> and I saw this, I was absolutely petrified. <laughs> so right here, <laughs> this is one of my besties. Her name is Charlotte. And she's a redney tarantula. I noticed you're biting your lip. <laughs> What's coming up for you? Yeah. Um, I was wishing this was something else. <laughs> uh, I saw a, a ball that I'm well, willing to play catch with you, no problem. Uh -huh. uh, a puppy, totally fine. <laughs> uh, this is definitely not up my alley. Okay. Um, but uh, I will say a couple of things, by the way. Uh -huh. And this is definitely me avoiding this, which we'll get to and I'll get to it. Okay. Um, you all also want to ask yourself, how is this going to impact my life? Mm. So sometimes it's about just working on any fear to strengthen that muscle. Yeah. But for example, I don't like roller coasters that much. Mm. I never really worked on getting over that fear because it doesn't really affect me that much. Mm. But, you know, social things, other things, it's important to work on. So I do believe everybody should work on conquering some fear. And there's yeah. always benefit to that. Yeah. But you always want to ask yourself, how is this going to translate into my everyday life? For sure. 100% um, happens to be arachnophobia is the fear of, you know, spiders, tarantulas, right? And it's one of the biggest fears out there. I noticed you're biting your lip. Is something <laughs> coming up for you? Yes. What's coming up? I'm here? petrified. <laughs> I did not think you were actually going to ask me to do this uh, today. Live uh, on air? No. All right. So what thoughts come up for you when you <sighs> see me picking? And I like that you took a deep breath. Yeah, first of all, physically, I'm noticing my chest is tightening up. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm feeling a little tension in my, in my neck. Okay. Um, and I'm just thinking, first thought is, what if it bites me? What if it, fear. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. There you go. So what I would tell a client is, you know, your brain is working properly. Your brain is built to protect you. But sometimes our brain does a bit too much. So at this point now, obviously, I would never want to harm you. So safety, it's a safety concern that that mm -hmm. spider might bite me. Um, so she won't bite you. Are you still afraid? How do you know she won't bite me? That's a great question. Well, I don't know 100%. Happens to be 
that the research that has been done with this specific tarantula is that they're super docile, very friendly. The history shows she's never bitten anyone. Um, they're super chill, super relaxed animals. But there's some risk there. Wow, I can't believe we're actually doing the this. The therapist okay. is in the hot seat. <laughs> um, absolutely. Okay, I have a couple of other safety questions. Okay. First of all, yeah. um, if she does bite, yeah. is it poisonous? Is it just... Uh... Excellent question. Excellent. Uh, if she does bite, it is not poisonous. Okay. It would just be like a mosquito bite. Okay. That makes me feel a, l a little better. Okay. Uh, I still do not want to do this. <laughs> okay. um, I was just on vacation and um, there was this huge uh, slide, water slide. I did not want to do, but my son really wanted me to do it. He uh -huh. wasn't allowed because he was too young. Uh -huh. um, and I said, this is what I do all day. Um, wow. I've got to do it. And I did it. So this is way more challenging than that. Wow. Um, I can't think of anything else actually that would not like as much as this. Maybe snakes, but okay. this is... Next time, guys, part right two, there. we're going to bring the snake. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. So is it okay if I open it? You can open okay, it. Okay, I can open it. So thanks for giving me permission. Here we go. So what are you <laughs> feeling right now? Um, apprehension. Uh -huh. Again, the chest is tightening. Okay. Um, my breathing is a little bit more shallow. Okay. And um, I'm just wondering how much I can trust you. Oh, trust. That's a very important piece. So in session, you can tell me how that this works with your with your clients as well. I always tell my clients, in order for this to work, there has to be a trust piece there, right? So in all my practice and all my experience, she's never bitten anyone. Um, happens to be she's a very, very calm, relaxed animal. So are you willing to give it a shot? Okay. Okay, here we go. Are you going to try it first? Well, sure. Ready? Oof. Okay. Take a deep breath. Here we go. Look at this. What's coming up for you? Are you crazy? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. All right, you ready? Okay. So you stick both hands out. There you go. I guess. Uh, yeah, that's it. All right, just take a deep breath. There you go. Well, um, what are you noticing? Is my heart is pounding. Mm -hmm. Can you see my heart pounding? <laughs> I, can, I can definitely feel something happening. Can you feel my hands trembling? I can see that. Take a deep breath. There you go. I'm also noticing my mind is trying to go to the future about the what if. Uh huh. What if she does this? What if she does that? I'm trying to bring it back to the present, what she's actually doing. That's amazing. Is she's actually just sitting on my hands. <sighs> what colors do you notice? Orange, black. Mm -hmm. There you go. If you actually pay attention, you notice she's a really beautiful creature. Okay. Uh, Can you see that? Um, Just beautiful patterns. Okay. Maybe yeah. tonight I'll be No, the truth is she, <laughs> she actually is pretty. If this was a drawing, I would agree with you. Uh-huh. But right. she's it's in your very uh, symmetrical. Yeah. What else are you noticing? Uh, you really can't hear my heart pounding right now. <laughs> okay, it's getting a little, a little better. There you go. Anxiety comes, but it also passes. There you go. You're doing so good. I am holding a tarantula. You're holding a real life. Now try to put your elbows on the table. Okay. There you go. Just relax a bit. Oh, look at that. She's, she's walking toward it. I think she wants to give you a hug. <laughs> there you go. How are you feeling? A little better. A little better. I was probably eight or nine out of 10. Now I'm probably a six. Okay. There you go. Let's adjust the mic. You're at a six. What help do you get to a six? Staying present. That's My mind is going to all kinds of places. Just bring it back to what's actually happening in front of me right now. Mm -hmm. I'm holding the trash there you go. So what's, that's, her, what's her name again? I completely forgot. Charlotte. Charlotte. Like Hello, Char Charlotte. That's it. You're talking to her. That's amazing. Really kind of being present in the moment. You're actually using your specific tools from being a therapist. Have you found that you can kind of tap into that? Yes. Uh, absolutely. Uh, like I said, I just went on that crazy uh, swimming uh, excursion uh -huh. down that slide. This is by far much more scarier. So what's um, your anxiety level now? About a three. Oh, look at that. What changed? I'm present. Uh -huh. I'm staying with it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm taking a risk. Um, I wouldn't say she's rather charming, but we uh, have to, she does We have seem to a take little... a picture of it and send it to your family. You ready? Yeah. Here we go. Look at this. This is awesome. This is great. Okay, now I'm down to a two or one. Look at that. And where, you're, where's she going? 
So curiosity, I love that. You see, you got curious instead of panicking and you know just dropping her. You said, "Where is she going?" Right, and there, yeah. and there you go. And I noticed you just bit your lip and you're licking your lip, and that's actually um, a way to calm your body. It's a subconscious response that we do. You know, animals do the same thing. And as I'm talking to you and you're listening to the sound of my voice, you're actually your nervous system is starting to kind of relax. And just, mm-hmm. There you go. How are you feeling now? This is exactly what I want to be doing on Monday nights. <laughs> this um, is great. You did it. A round of applause wow. for you. There you go. When you take her off, I'll give myself a round of applause. <laughs> wow. Oh what was that experience like for you? <sighs> wow. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, that was a huge fear of mine. Wow. I, I was actually going to tell you when we walked in, I saw that, that don't even think about making me do that. Um, <laughs> doesn't affect my life. I'd just rather just not, not do it. But, um, wow, that is a, a huge, huge fear. Um, I should mention, by the way, that if it's something that I was trying to conquer, I would probably do it again and again, uh-huh. um, and, uh, do it a few more times. But my level of anxiety from probably nine out of 10 before this is probably overall about a two. Wow. Um, that feels freeing. It yeah. feels freeing that I can face something that I thought I could never do in a million years. Yeah. So um, we just did it live. This was not rehearsed. We did not practice no, this. No. And and you did this live on camera. And this is so doable. And we saw all the... Re- Are you okay? Yeah, I'm just like, uh, did she poop on me? Or <laughs> she, a... she didn't poop on I, you. Okay. But we have a tissue here. If you need. There we go. Um, but what I would say is allowing ourselves to go, to be placed in that kind of space and saying it's coming from a place of fear you asked all the questions, which is excellent. A lot of the times I notice people freeze up. Yeah. If they uh, are afraid, they're scared to use their voice and, and say what's coming up for them. I see you're smiling. What's, yeah. co- what's coming no, that, up That's you? often what happens. People get in their heads yeah. and they go into a shell. Um, mm-hmm. When we talk about something, that's the first step to facing it. Yeah. And staying present is is absolutely key. Yeah. Staying in the moment. And I noticed mm-hmm. you were doing that. You were mm-hmm. using that strategy. I was noticing the senses. How does mm-hmm. it feel? How does she feel on my hand? What color is she? Uh, my mind at the beginning was going to, she's going to bite me. If she bites me, how am I going to get home tonight? Mm-hmm. What's my wife going to think? Uh, yeah. Who's this crazy guy in front of me who's <laughs> making me do these things? And I allowed those thoughts to be there and just yeah. gently kept on re-engaging again, hundreds of times, many little times, just gently re-engaging what's actually happening in the moment. Do you feel like possibly something has been lifted off of your shoulders yeah absolutely this especially in this shoulder wow um i i'm i'm not kidding i, I could not have imagined doing this uh before and like i said mo- most of the exposures i do are with with people who have a specific fear about something that affects their de- everyday life yeah i wouldn't have picked this exactly. but knowing that i can do this help will help mm-hmm. me in other areas too so right this is also an important piece here when do we know when when do we know we need help Mm-hmm. And it's when it's a starting to affect your activities of daily living, that's time to reach out for some support. Also, addressing the stigma around mental health and therapy. Oftentimes, there's this, sometimes, this idea that if you're going to therapy to, to, to help you overcome this fear, something is wrong with you. But in reality, for somebody who works with professionals, that's far from the truth. Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, most of the people who come to my office have been suffering for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and they tell me, why didn't I come sooner? You know, within a matter of weeks, I tell people, if you haven't seen any improvement after four sessions with me, you should fire me. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm not saying everything will be cured then, but you should at least understand the path. For sure. And um, it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. I mean, people go to uh, a doctor. They go to a masseuse. They go to a personal trainer. Uh, we can go to a mental health expert to help yeah. us with our mental health. Um, it's everywhere, and we all need it. If someone is dealing with a family member or a loved one who has anxiety or panic, what's a way that you'd suggest that we can support them? Uh, so the first thing is don't try to fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, we want to just normalize and validate, right? How many times have you been overwhelmed with something or worried about something? You just needed that calm voice just to say something. I hear you. Or even just to listen to you. So the first step is just listening. Um, wow, I get it. That must be really scary. Validating it. Some people they find that patronizing. So maybe you, may, you can actually have to always validate with words. Mm-hmm. Some people it's just listening. That itself is just validating. Um, and the first thing is just like we said, just normalize. There's nothing wrong with you. People are like, what am I? I'm this, I'm this professional who has this big company, and uh, I can't go on a train, or I'm worried about X, Y, Z. Or I had a client, uh, very successful and thriving in most areas of his life. He comes in two weeks after his wedding. I'm petrified. My wife is going to die. 
and it's affecting his life. What can I do? What's wrong with me? Why am I worrying that this should be the happiest time in my life? And I just got married and I can't stop thinking about the fact that she could die. So the first thing we did is just normalize it. When I told him how many people have similar fears and worries, he, I could just see, he just, oh, wait, this is not me, I'm, I'm not crazy. I said, no, this is somebody you care about most in the world mm -hmm. uh, and you're feeling vulnerable. Uh, for him, we had a, a whole worry script thing. I just actually maybe we should mention something here. Until uh, now, we've been talking a lot about specific things that I worry about in the world, whether it's spiders, whether it's planes, trains, driving, things I can actually do something about. I can face them. What if I worry about things that I have no control over? Mm. Uh, health, relationships, uh, a job, the security of it, a global pandemic. What do I do then? Uh, and for those kinds of worries, we actually want to do what's called a worry script. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but when you're worrying about something, it's on your mind all the time. We actually want to set aside a specific amount of time at a specific time each day to actually purposely worry. Not avoiding it, but write down the things you're worried about. With this, with this client I just mentioned, we had a whole script out. We wrote it together uh, in detail about how his wife getting sick in the present, first person, present tense. She's getting sicker and sicker. Uh, these are the things that are happening, and she eventually passes away. And we spoke about how he mourns that. We went into specific details. And we didn't avoid it. And for about 30 days, he read the script, he rewrote it 20 minutes a day, every single day. And he worried about it more and more, but it was at a scheduled time in a specific manner. So if people are worrying about specific things or themes that they have no control over, I actually want them to worry about it, but at a set specific time consistently, and people find within a few weeks, it's not that, oh, he's okay now. Uh, it, it, it's never going to happen. I'm okay. Of course not. Like we spoke about risk. There's uncertainty all the time. Mm -hmm. but you get more comfortable embracing the risk. Just like with 98% of the areas of his life, he's fine with the risk. He got more comfortable with it. When we learn how to face it, we see, wow, there's risk everywhere. There's uncertainty everywhere. I don't have control over most things. And at first it's scary, but then it's just humbling. Yeah. I don't need control. I can focus on the things I can focus on and do the things that are important to me, make the most of the time that he does have with her. Um, and that's what happens. So those thoughts and feelings do come up occasionally, but... Like I tell people all the time, anxiety isn't an on-off switch. It's often a volume button. And we just want to lower some of that volume. And um, within, a, within a few weeks, uh, he felt confident to be able to go, to, to go by himself and do these things by himself. Wow, I love that. I love the, the, the idea of it being not an on and off button, but more of like mm -hmm. being able to have the power to turn the volume up or down, lower or higher. This was so empowering just to hear your experience and some of the stories, the success stories that you've done with your clients, whether it's going on planes and trains and elevators and taking them to different places. By the way, I just want to mention, not many therapists actually do that. It's very, it's very uncommon for someone to take a plane with a, with, a, with a client, but I can imagine the client felt so thankful to oh, you. It's, it's amazing. Part of my job is that people tell me I've been reading about therapy books, I've been watching things online, yeah. and I just could not bring myself to do it. And I usually go with somebody once. I don't wow. need to do any more than that. The first time we get in the car, the first time we go on a plane, the first time we go, we go on. Now, they'll need to do it repeatedly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, initially with my instruction and support on the phone and then eventually by themselves um, because we want to do things repeatedly. We can't only do things once. That actually right. often makes it worse mm -hmm. um, unless you stay long enough. But um, it's so empowering to say, okay, wow, I can have another human being with me who understands exactly what I'm going through and will walk me through each step uh, you know, holding my hand and we'll get through this one step at a time. And within a day, wow. sometimes very, a lot less than that, they can see the path forward. Uh, before I came here tonight, I never could imagine holding one of those things. Uh -huh. um, and now I can see the path forward. If I want to work with spiders, probably not. Um, <laughs> but now at least I understand the concept. I'm a lot more comfortable. Yeah. And it's because we did this in person. If you would have, if I would have watched a podcast or listened to something and uh, started doing this myself at home, first of all, I wouldn't have done it. I just mm. would not have done it myself. But having your calm presence mm. and knowing that you've done this many times and being in person doing this together has given me more confidence. Wow. So some people, it's enough to read a book, to talk to somebody, to watch something. But most people need a little bit of a, a guiding hand. A little bit more, for sure. All right. So usually what I like to do at the end of every podcast, we play like a little game, right? So this is just to get to know a little bit more about David. Um, so I'm going to throw the ball to you. You catch the ball wherever your thumbs land on. That's the question you read, and then you throw it back to me, and then I'll go. You ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Good catch. My claim to fame. Hmm. That's an interesting one. 
Um, oh, you've all missed on me here. Uh, <laughs> I noticed, can I call you out on something? Sure. I noticed you just bit your lip and licked your lip. What thought came up for you? Oh, no, I don't have anything. Here I am on a podcast. What am wow. I possibly going to say? I can't think of anything that makes me uh, uh, my claim to fame. Um, it's interesting. You, you want to hear something yeah. cool? As soon as you said that question, I immediately had one for you. Oh, okay. I'm all is. Wait, but first I want to hear yours, <laughs> and I'll tell you what I thought for you. My claim to fame. I'm really going blank here. Blank? I would yeah. think for you, I would say... David is the therapist that goes with clients on a plane. That is the, qu I oh, think that's. So you see, I completely didn't get the question then. Uh, the way I thought the question was, you know, what makes you uh, something that's cool about you that you're famous for? I don't know. You went on some kind of a TV show or I you think, met somebody famous. I actually have met one or two famous people, but. Um, I think that is so cool. I've had a couple of famous clients that I cannot oh, talk about. Of course. Um, but uh, that's, that's another, another thing. But I understand. I hear what you're saying. So what, what's unique about my, my claim to fame in terms of what I do with my work? That I can talk about from here until tomorrow. But I will go with you in person. We will face your fears together. Step, one step at a time. I love that. Okay, All can right. I throw this back to you? Sure. Okay, here we go. Um, my childhood dream. This is an interesting one. You know, growing up, I wanted to be a vet. And the older I got, I noticed it's not as pleasurable as it seems. Um, but I found a way to still use animals every single day. And not having that to to deal with like, you know, sick animals, uh, but healthy animals and being able to help people. And this is like, I am I definitely, ha I'm, I'm trying to continue being the hero for my childhood self. That's for sure. Working with animals. I love that so much. Um, and being able to do that Fantastic. as an adult um, is, is really pleasurable for me. So as we wrap up, what are some of the, some of the last words you may have for our listeners um, as a conclusion for this whole podcast? Uh, any last thoughts? Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me on. Of course. Uh, this is definitely a conquered fear of mine of coming <laughs> on a podcast. So I definitely appreciate this. And it's got a lot easier as, as the session went on. Uh, the number one thing I want people to know is it does not have to be this hard. Mm. There's help out there. Uh, yeah. Don't wait. Um, you know, we spend so much time investing in so many areas in our lives. Let this be your time to finally invest in yourself, understand yourself, uh, face your fears, conquer them, and get that freedom and independence back. And that's, that's what I want people to take away. Drop the mic. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. You said it. You did it. Cheers. This was such a pleasure.